Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. My name is Erhart Monka. I'm with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, and welcome to the Vermont Affordable Housing Show. Uh, with me today is Mike McNamara, who is the HUD Vermont Field Office Director, um, and we're going to be uh, going a little bit into uh, taking a little trip down uh, memory lane, talking about housing over the last 35 years. Um, uh, Mike is uh, about to retire from uh, his longtime service uh, in the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and we'll get to Mike in two seconds. Uh, but beforehand, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. One is, as always, this is uh, live at 525, uh, and it is a call-in show. If you have a question for us uh, related, hopefully, to affordable housing, uh, please dial 862 Three nine six six, and uh, Mike and I will uh, do our best to answer uh, answer your question. Uh, and to our quick announcements, so it has been a very busy fall and now winter uh, in the Vermont affordable housing world. Uh, next week, we have our monthly affordable housing coalition meeting on Wednesday, December 11th in Montpelier. Uh, and the coalition will be voting on its annual uh, state legislative priorities. Uh, also coming up um, next week on Thursday the 12th, the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee will be having one of its series of roundtable conversations uh, out in the uh, regions of, of Vermont. This one will be on, uh, again, Thursday, December 12th in uh, Bellows Falls at the Rockingham Town Hall from 1230 to 2.30. Um, also, uh, State Treasurer Beth Pierce uh, will have a public hearing uh, for stakeholders uh, on affordable housing. Um, she is uh, to deliver a legislatively mandated report on uh, how to create more affordable housing for uh, low-income uh, working and uh, Vermonters and those living on fixed incomes. Um, that is going to be held uh, Monday, December 16th from 1 to 3 p.m. at the Pavilion Fourth Floor Auditorium in Montpelier. Um, last not least, we have several work groups that are wrapping up their work, uh, one on uh, mobile home parks uh, and the needs of uh, mobile home park residents, uh, a second one on rental housing safety in the state of Vermont, and then recently wrapped up is the uh, work of a legislatively mandated um, work group that the Agency of Human Services put together around the underutilization of federal rental assistance vouchers and the need for additional supportive services to uh, pair with those. Uh, so those are our quick announcements. Um, and having uh, delivered those, I want to turn to Mike and say thank you for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, Mike, uh, for uh, folks who've uh, watched this show over the years may recall that Mike actually originated this show many years ago uh, when it was the HUD show. Uh, and then uh, when that ended, uh, Mike basically turned it over to us to do the affordable housing show a number of years ago. So uh, welcome I'm, back. I'm not Mike. sure I'm comfortable sitting on this side of the table. <laughs> That's right. You were probably over here answering uh, answering questions that, that came in. Oh, uh, yes. It probably had nothing to do with affordable housing. <laughs> Sometimes it did. I remember one time I took over your show and uh, because you thought you were going to be late uh, coming back from Europe. And uh, I was interviewing our uh, former colleague, Ken Sassarossi, and I think you called us called in from the airport um, just to, I think, razz us, basically. Of course. Uh, um, but um, well, in uh, all, all joking aside, um, so uh, we've got Mike on the show today to talk uh, about his 35 years in affordable housing in the state of Vermont. And this is actually one in a series of interviews we've uh, we've done with um, folks who've uh, been longtime contributors, major contributors to uh, the affordable housing world in Vermont. Uh, Ken Sassarossi um, retired a um, year or two back. Uh, Sarah Carpenter uh, from the Housing Finance Agency. Uh, most recently, Ted Wimpy uh, from the Fair Housing Project at CBOEO this summer. So, um, And we've interviewed a number of these folks with their uh, thoughts and reflections uh, on uh, the past state and current state of affordable housing. So, Mike, maybe uh, turning to you, maybe give viewers sort of a, uh, a bit of an overview of, of the uh, depth and extent of um, the different roles that you've um, filled that, that uh, contributed in a major way to uh, moving affordable housing forward. Okay, well, I came to Vermont in 1985. Um, at that time, the Board of Commissioners of the Housing Authority were looking for a new executive director. Burlington Housing Authority. Burlington Housing Authority. I was there for 10 years. Um, we did several projects during that time to turn the Housing Authority around, including $3 million of rehab at Franklin Square, um, almost a million dollars worth of sheet piling 
behind Riverside Avenue, oh my God. which is back in the news yep. um, recently. recently. Yeah. Um, I haven't been over there to see how uh, sheet piling is standing up, but I think it should be okay. I, I think the rest of the, the hillside might need some kind of help like that. But when you this was a role that um, you filled when Bernie Sanders was mayor, and I remember one of major, Bernie's major inif initiatives was, as it is today, still around public housing and reforming public housing and, and making a difference. Uh, for exactly, and at that time, it was very difficult to find the money uh, to come up with to to repair the housing, which had been neglected for a really long time. So we put most of our efforts in the front end into turning around Franklin Square and Riverside Avenue, and then we moved on to the elderly high rise at St. Paul Street. This and, was the Reagan years, so there were massive yeah, cutbacks. Um, exactly. In, in but, housing. but you know, when I think of those years, there was so much going on in Burlington. You know, the Burlington Community Land Trust had been founded under Bernie's while Bernie was mayor. Um, along that time, the founding of Vermont Housing Conservation Board, yeah. which had a major impact in saving Northgate, the Northgate buyout yeah. that happened in the late 80s. The three political figures that really dominated that discussion were Bernie as mayor, Governor Cunin, yeah. and Patrick Leahy as senator back then. Uh, they all came together to help us put together a 20, almost $22 million uh, buyout um, out there in the new North End, the largest, at that time, the largest uh, public, the largest HUD uh, aided housing. It's still the largest development in the to state. To this day, it's still yep. the largest uh, until Cambrian Rise is fully built out. It's going to be the largest rental housing development, affordable or otherwise. And and also around that time, um, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation yeah. was started, and I was I was on the founding board of that, um, and the Housing Authority actually did the first project with VEIC, the cogeneration project that. at uh, 230 St. Paul Street. And now, of course, all these years later, VEIC has grown into a juggernaut of energy services and, and now is looking to create a permanent home on the last parcel yeah. in the Winooski redevelopment, which I'll get to in a second. But, but when you think of those things, at that time, the Committee on Temporary Shelter was opening new shelters at the Fi House and Elmwood Avenue. They saved the Wilson Hotel. I was on the COTS board at that time. You and I both were on the Lake Champlain Housing Development Board. We built Salmon Run off uh, Riverside Avenue. First first tax credit, uh, affordable tax credit, rent, new, new construction rental housing development. In the exactly. State. And then uh, some buildings at Fort Ethan Allen. And I convinced Ken Sassarossi to leave Winooski Housing Authority and become mm -hmm. the first executive director yep of the Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation, which got me chased around their dinner table by his wife, Judy, <laughs> uh, saying, why is he giving up you know, a pension and good health benefits and everything? And Government job. <laughs> that's, that's all worked out in everybody's favor. But well, I, and Lake Champlain eventually, um, years later, merged with the Burlington Community Land Trust to form Champlain Housing Trust, which today is the largest land trust in not just the country, but the world, basically. Yes, and absolutely, both of those organizations really um, put their future together by coming together, and I think that was a pretty, yeah. pretty unique and uh, forward-thinking yeah thing that they did, um, merging when they did. Now, I, I stayed in Burlington for 10 years, um, and then I went on, the, there's, a, there's a brief period that I was out of state in Virginia at the Alexandria Housing and Redevelopment Authority, uh, 18 very tumultuous months, but I, I was able to put practices in place and do a couple of major bond deals that at least got them on a good financial footing and, and they're in very good shape today. And then when I did come back to Vermont in 1996, I took a job as the deputy director of Vermont Housing Finance Agency, um, which was also uh, 2.5 years of very tumultuous times. It was when the, the, uh, the Housing Finance Agency um, had the Mortgage Guarantee Board, which um, eventually uh, failed um, in one of those years uh, while I was there. And the 
the fallout from that was was pretty dramatic. Yeah. But also during those times, um, VHFA was able to make good inroads with the Vermont with the low income housing tax credits. And another thing I think that was huge was the creation of Housing Vermont. Yeah. Um, housing Vermont is so integral to all deals that get done now in Vermont. I remember when when Kevin Loso was looking at potential partners for his um, Forest Park development, now Hickory Street. In Rutland. In Rutland. He said to me, he had all these, he showed me a list of all these out-of-state folks that he had who do this kind of work. And I said, there's one that I don't see on the list, yeah. Kevin. And Why says, are you going out which, of state? <laughs> which one's that? I said, Housing Vermont. And um, ultimately, he did speak with Housing Vermont and you know, did three very successful uh, phases of renovation. Transformative. Transformative. Absolutely I mean, transformative. he took probably the worst neighborhood in the state of Vermont and made it an absolutely stunning, spectacular neighborhood that really works. And, and I think that, um, you know, having the, all of the funders at the table, um, that was really the first time that a housing authority came forward and said, you know, with, with the fallout from the Reagan years, we just don't get the money we need. And they had tried. Yeah. They had tried three times in a row to get the type of funding we got right. for Franklin Road Square six. and, and didn't, didn't get it. At, at that time, it was called uh, Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. C -C 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 um, like and, then, and then Hope Six came, and I know they went for, for one or two of those as well. But this was an example of someone saying, to heck with, with HUD. I say that in the nicest way. <laughs> but, but let's see if there are HUD resources that already exist, CDBG, home, and, and other forms that we can mix with, with other financing and come up with something that works for everybody. And I think really looking back on it, the fact that they didn't get a big dollop of money from HUD was probably a good thing because I think it gave the housing authority, Rutland Housing Authority, and the funders the opportunity to sort of step back mm -hmm. and see what do we really want and and what, here? what's doable. And and now the neighborhood actually connects. It used to be two dead end streets that didn't connect, and now it's it's a it's a beautiful neighborhood. If you ever get down to Rutland, you have to go find. Uh, Hickory Street and and take a ride around. You won't be, you won't be scared at all. But you would have been very scared back in the day. So you bring up an interesting point about the kind of creativity that um, really was necessitated by uh, a la an inability to tap into what might have been the traditional funds for that kind of public housing redevelopment. I, I think it's a uh, an important point because it also points back to the era in the 80s that we were just talking about. Uh, all of that kind of housing ferment and uh, the creativity that you just kind of got done describing in Rutland and you know talked about a little bit earlier, um, all of that was really necessitated by uh, the Reagan era and these massive cutbacks in federal funds. The state of Vermont and most states did not invest any of their own taxpayer dollars into affordable housing. And that was a time when um, we had to, those of us involved um, in housing had to figure out like, how are we gonna do this? Public housing is not growing. There's no more money for public housing. How are we gonna develop affordable housing for uh, working Vermonters, uh, working poor, people working in service sector jobs, people living on fixed incomes. But that, um, that challenge of the pullback of the federal government created all of this creative thought, um, including the creation of the Housing Conservation Board, preserving Northgate, everything. Well, and now, I mean, HUD is, is now doing the rental um, assistance demonstration, which is really an effort to get housing authorities to do redevelopment yeah. projects like, like Rutland did. Rutland didn't use any, any RAD um, funds for that. But I think now uh, HUD has realized with a $30 billion backlog yeah. in modernization for public housing, that there needs to be different approaches. So now with the rental um, assistance demonstration, 
Um, we have Burlington, Springfield have already mm -hmm. done their, their units. Um, and I know now- Others are following suit. Others, Brattleboro, uh, Bennington, and, uh, and others are following suit, Rutland, yeah. uh, for, their, for their senior housing. And, and again, this is a result of a new program being created because, well, you said $30 billion. I've heard figures up to $50 billion right. as the backlog for uh, public housing that is in desperate need of upgrading. Um, we have some of the lowest income, most vulnerable uh, people in the United States living in some of the worst housing that's gov government, quote unquote, housing um, through, uh, through through local local housing authorities that is in, in terrible shape. So RAD is another example of some creative thinking that came out of um, the inability to provide the resources that, that, you know, that are needed. Exactly. Um, so, so it is a different paradigm for HUD um, to move in this direction. It was actually a program that came together during the Obama yeah. administration, but it's really been embraced on both sides of the aisle because for the first time, it, I, I remember the story when, um, when Chip Castle, who's the executive director of the Barry Housing Authority, first got there 10 years or so ago. He went to a bank yeah. one day with his portfolio and he showed them all the properties BHA owned and said, well, what do you think? And they said, well, wow, this is a nice portfolio. We could really loan you a lot of money. And he said, that's great because I have a lot of work I want to get done energy wise and otherwise to these buildings. And then he ran it by HUD and HUD says, whoa, 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 time out. You can't just do that. And so what this, what RAD does is it frees up housing authorities to be able to go out and use the same kind of tools yeah. other developers use, loaned money, that type of thing. Um, and it provides an operating subsidy through project-based uh, rental assistance that's very different from the operating funds that, public, that come to public housing through the public housing budget, which my recollection is that HUD's own studies show that um, housing authorities on average are only getting 80 to 85 percent of what it actually takes to operate, responsibly operate uh, public housing, maintain it in good shape, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that residents have the services that they need. Well, in the 10 years I was at the Housing Authority um, in, in Burlington, we never got 100% of operating right. subsidy. And if we were in the mid 80s, we were usually you were, pretty happy. Yeah, I, I remember going down to like 75% yeah, at, yeah. at one point. So um, public, uh, the Section 8 style uh, project-based rental assistance is uh, a much stabler source of funding uh, in, in that sense. So, so 20 years ago, I, I took up um, from my friend Joanne Triano at the Montpelier Housing Authority, it, it came off, an offer came to me to, to come to HUD and work at HUD. And Joanne said to me, um, Mike, you either have to take this job or stop complaining about <laughs> HUD. <laughs> so I did take the job 20 years ago. And, and you became the man for <clears> HUD <throat> yes. in Vermont. <laughs> and at that time, we were a larger office than we are today. Yeah. Right. You had uh, John uh, Olmsted doing um, fair housing, uh, not fair housing, sorry. Um, <laughs> Single family. The other FHA uh, yep. And uh, we acronym. had a couple of community builders and support staff. Yeah. So things have, have deteriorated some since then, but there have been things that- Largely I, a result of lack of funding or funding yes, cutbacks at precisely. the federal level. But in, but in the heyday of it all, um, uh, the state of Vermont was able to do an extraordinary development in Winooski. Um, the downtown redevelopment in Winooski, um, that was the largest, um, and at its time it was the largest HUD Section 108 loan guarantee mm -hmm. in the history of HUD. It was 24250000 And the state of Vermont paid that back very quickly um, because they didn't want to be on the hook right. for that. Right. And, uh, the, but the, the loan guarantee, if it had gone south, would have been the state's share of community development or CDG correct. block grant dollars. Correct. So the long and the short of it is Winooski would not have happened were it not for that, um, that Section 108 loan guarantee. Um, 
And that essentially paved the way for the infrastructure to get done yeah. so the buildings could be built and also for the parking garage to get constructed, which they constructed buildings around. It's but a I, model of smart growth. Um, yeah, it, re it really is. We want to is. develop in our downtowns. We don't want to, you know, have sprawl, sprawl out into, you know, the remaining cow pastures. And now, and now, and now to read that VEIC is looking to put their headquarters on the last parcel know, of that original urban redevelopment yeah. project from the 60s is just, I just think that's cosmic yeah. that that's coming together well actually the way it, it is you know what's really interesting also you mentioned v this uh, you mentioned veic before also uh, one of the things that happened legislatively this last year is uh, the legislature has mandated the uh, public utilities commission to expand the whole idea of uh, energy efficiency utilities to what are, are being called all fuels utilities to include uh, all fuels all the unregulated um, fuels and and to do that um, in a way that um, the purpose of that being to uh, try to make um, better progress uh, on the state's climate change, uh, climate crisis goals. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, emerges out of that because VEIC, as you mentioned, uh, basically uh, operates Efficiency Vermont, which is the, the statewide um, electrical efficiency utility. Right. Now, another thing that, that happened, uh, sometimes things just happen and they have to be responded to. Uh, Tropical Storm Irene in 2011 was a huge deal throughout the state of Vermont, but particularly um, in Brattleboro, Brattleboro Housing Authority, uh, their whole, a whole development. This is the Melrose Terrace. Melrose thing. Terrace. Or it used to be called Melrose Terrace. Yes, yeah. and now through, through some more innovative housing development with, the, with Partner Housing Vermont, uh, they were able to replace a lot of that housing with Red Clover housing. But the other thing that happened in all that was at first it was hard for people to get information on where do we get help. Mm -hmm. And actually on this show back then in 2011, uh, we had all the state and FEMA leaders on this show live and it went out. I don't know if, it, it, if this had ever happened except on an election night, but we went out live with all the other pegs peg stations nice. in Vermont and it was it was a real it was really quite a good deal that day yeah is people could figure out there was somebody from the SBA here talking about what SBA allowed and fe what FEMA provided and so forth so that was that was kind of a cool thing and that that happened right at this desk Very with a cool. lot more people than we have tonight. Yeah, hard, hard to imagine how they all fit around the table. But but, but the other thing I want to talk about is um, in 2010, um, the city of Burlington got a planning grant for smart growth uh, from HUD. It was a little less than $250,000. And it's probably the, the last money of its kind that will ever be seen. I, I don't think it's going too far out on a limb to say that. But the thing that came out of that grant was Plan BTV, which is one of the few planning documents that has not stayed on the shelf. Uh, Mayor Weinberger certainly has taken it as um, his personal um, blueprint for how things should go as far as developing affordable housing and whatnot. And certainly, um, you know, I, I know that there's been a lot of um, moderation to what's going to happen at City Place, but originally uh, Don Sinex, who, who bought the project initially, told me that were it not for Plan BTV, because in Plan BTV there's two pages about what needed to happen to the mall, mm -hmm. and he said without that information there, or without what he took as Burlington's commitment to what they wanted to see at the mall. He never would have bought it. Huh. So, so, you know, they so were- we can blame HUD for the, uh, the <laughs> hole in the center yeah, of town, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, call me, call me, call me right now. 862-3966. Um, but in any case, so whatever emerges out of that, and I expect something will, I, I don't think uh, this is gonna it, be a long-term hole in the ground. But people from headquarters were asking, well, 
give us an example of HUD money that's leveraged other money. And yeah. I, I sent them something oh that God. said, well, we put up about 250000 in planning money, and it looks like the, the development could be around $200 million. And, Probably the best, and it, best leverage ratio, however. And they not. wrote back on email and said, you mean $20 million? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so we're down from that. I think it's, they're saying $120 yeah, million or so. But in any flawed. case, that, that was a major, a major factor for the city. And it also incorporates in that plan sort of a blueprint for what happens on the waterfront as well. And we've already seen some of those things take place with the sailing center and the new marina and yep. some of those yep. things. So, so on an economic development standpoint, uh, there are things that have happened uh, with HUD money over the past 20 years Actually, that uh, have been pretty significant. Um, you know, that you, you mentioned the, the, the waterfront there. Um, didn't we originally do a lot of the waterfront development with a HUD Section 108 loan guarantee? Yes. Um, Burlington was actually. Burlington was like yeah. a, uh, this was, uh, I think, back when Peter Clavel was mayor and uh, um, maybe even Jonathan Leopold might have been treasurer uh, at the time. I, I don't remember the details, but we bought the, um, I, I think some of that money went into buying the waterfront park uh, yep. and uh, doing the infrastructure um, that created uh, Lake Street, that removed the railroad tracks, removed um, the, uh, the old gas tank, the oil tanks down there. Everything that we see now down there is thanks to, in, in part, a HUD 108, uh, one of these 108. Well, long Burlington guarantees. was always very bullish on the use of Section 108 yeah. Yeah. long guarantees. And actually, when, when the state of Vermont ultimately did theirs, they leaned on Burlington a lot right. to For figure out as, if this was a good thing yeah. to do. Um, my recollection at the time was that kind of one of the sort of unspoken mottos at CETO, which was always figuring out new ways to tap into HUD dollars, was if, it's, if they don't say we can't do it in the regs, we could go ahead and do right. it. Even, even if we kill them later. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> Mike, um, we're uh, running towards the end of our, um, our time. Time does fly, uh, whether it's 35 years or, or 30 minutes. Um, what are, I, I hope you've covered you know, what you consider to be most of the uh, major uh, things that you've been involved in in that, in that time. Um, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts for the future uh, as you're kind of leaving the profession here? Um, what, uh, what would your message to your colleagues be who are uh, still uh, mining uh, the fields, um, so to speak, of affordable housing? Well, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic. I know some people aren't, but... I think uh, Vermont is where it is today. We, don't, we virtually do not have some of the problems many other states have with the preservation of affordable housing. Yeah. Uh, Vermont really Housing well Finance that. Agency and the other agencies banded together very early on and they've had a prolonged commitment to preservation. That's been really good for us. The strength of the housing agencies themselves, we talked about the creation of Vermont Housing Conservation Board, but also the Housing Finance Agency, the State Housing Authority, the Agency of Commerce and Community Affairs, all very strong. The strength and commitment of our- And com working together. And working together, yeah. exactly. Not, not like competing with each other as happens in exactly. some other states. The strength and commitment of the congressional offices, you know, I, I say we have probably the best congressional office um, in the country, but also innovations by housing partners, and in that group, of course, there are housing authorities and nonprofits. Uh, the SASH program has been a wonderful thing yeah. uh, for elderly folks. Yep. Uh, BHA in Burlington has done tremendous things with the Department of Corrections. Uh, homeless youth has, has gotten a lot of money in the past few years yep. Yep. from HUD. The DREAM mentoring program has just been Started outrageously with, yep. Yep. successful in in Vermont and now Massachusetts and Philadelphia, and, and you gave them their first uh, office. Actually, they shared offices. Yeah, we don't we don't talk about oh, that oh, too much. Oh, sorry, never mind. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, actually, uh, Dream and the Good News Garage. We we helped at the very outset of of their beginning. Well, 
clearly, Mike, you've had a major, major impact on uh, affordable housing in, in Vermont. Uh, I think all of us, you know, thank you for that incredible, um, incredible role that you've you've played in so many different, uh, so many different capacities, and you know, just the creative thinking, and then also the sense of humor that um, you've you've brought to the the work has been, uh, I think, much appreciated by all your colleagues. Well, thank you, thank you. So um, we're going to be signing off here shortly. Um, and thanks again uh, to our audience for tuning in today. Uh, and again, thanks to our guest, Mike McNamara, um, soon to be retired from uh, retired. the HUD field office here in uh, Vermont. Um, this has uh, been the Vermont Affordable Housing Show. My name is Erhard Monka, coordinator for the Affordable Housing Coalition. Please join us uh, for our next show on February 5th at 525, live at 525. Um, till then, thanks again for watching. So...